German historians and theologians were heading for the country's great university cities of Leipzig and Tübingen. They were centers of a dispute about one of the key foundations of the Christian faith. European scholars were locked in a heated debate about the reliability and the authority of the Bible. For centuries, devout Christians had believed that the Bible was the unchangeable word of God. Suddenly, these sacred scriptures were being challenged. This begins with the Old Testament. So first of all, you have people using the word myth to describe things like Genesis, um, the creation and the flood. And then, slightly later, you have David Friedrich Strauss. David Strauss boldly published a book that doubted the truth of the New Testament. He was the first scholar to argue that the miracle stories attributed to Jesus, Christ walking on water, or the feeding of the 5,000, were mythical. It's absolutely predictable that what Strauss wrote would have caused outrage. But Strauss himself seemed genuinely surprised that people were so angry. And he just didn't have the guts to go through with these ideas. He himself became a kind of outcast and tried writing much more conservative texts to recover his reputation. Um, but the public in both Germany and Britain were yet yeah, genuinely outraged by what he'd written. Devout Christians dismissed Strauss's attack on the miracle stories as heretical. It was more difficult to counter the claim made by scholars like Strauss that the Bible text itself was unreliable. In the early days of the Bible, of course, there were no printing presses. So the biblical text was transmitted by human beings writing out the text and copying it again and again and again and again. And that inevitably leads to errors creeping into the process. Therefore, Strauss and others claimed, the Bible text couldn't be the exact and unchanged word of God. What critical historians discovered was that the texts on which Christianity were based were not reliable. They weren't historically authentic. And that meant what price the word of God? If you can't trust the texts in which these things are transmitted, you can't trust your own religious foundations. This was dynamite for the majority of 19th century Christians. Scholars had the audacity to challenge the very word of God. Constantine Tischendorf, an ambitious Bible scholar in the German city of Leipzig, was alarmed by the challenge to the faith. He was an expert in ancient Greek, the language in which the original Bible text was written. But when the first printed Bibles were made, the oldest available manuscripts in Greek were from the 12th century, over a thousand years after the life of Jesus. Tischendorf would search for the earliest Bible text to show that the Bible had a solid historic foundation. For the Christian faith, the stakes could not be higher. Nothing in theology is as important as the careful study of the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament to prove their genuineness. I will reconstruct, if possible, the exact text of the Bible as it came from the pen of the sacred writer. To find out more, I travel to London. At the British Library, I meet curator Dr. Scott McKendrick. Well, the Codex Sinaiticus is arguably the most important manuscript in the entire British Library's collection. It really is as important as that. I mean, it's arguably one of the most important books in the world. The Codex Sinaiticus contained much of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament reassuringly familiar to 19th century Bible readers. But on closer inspection, the Codex revealed some disturbing features. Christians believed that the Bible was the unchanged and unchangeable Word of God. Yet this earliest Bible was full of edits and corrections. Virtually every page has uh, corrections on it. 
There are nearly 35,000 corrections in the entire manuscript. Um, some of these are more obvious than others. And wh what are they? As part of making this manuscript, you have three, possibly four, scribes who are involved in that exercise. And one of them uh, is a sort of chief editor, we think, and he's one of the most interventionist correctors. But second phase is several centuries later, in the seventh century, you have a series of correctors who actually change the character of the text, often quite dramatically. Most of the thousands of edits are tiny, though any change can be regarded as significant. And when one edit concerns words uttered by Jesus as he was dying on the cross, it's enormously challenging. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oddly, this was marked as doubtful by one of the correctors of the Sinaiticus, but reinstated by a later corrector. There are 35,000 edits in the Codex Sinaiticus, which suggests that the scribes were unsure about the integrity of the biblical text. But the anomalies of the Codex didn't end there. The most intriguing and to some troubling feature of the Sinaiticus is the ending of the Gospel of Mark, which describes what happens after Jesus is crucified and his body is put into a tomb. So in Codex Sinaiticus, Mark's Gospel, which is our earliest Gospel, ends at verse 8 of chapter 16. So chapter 16 tells us about the discovery of the empty tomb. The women go to the tomb, they discover it to be empty, they meet a mysterious angelic figure who tells them that Jesus has risen from the dead and then he tells them to go and proclaim that message to the disciples and to Peter. But the women are afraid and they tell nothing to anyone. So that's the way that the gospel ends in Sinaiticus. The ending of Mark, recounted in 19th century Bibles like the King James Bible, is simply not there. Then they went out and ran away from the tomb, trembling with amazement. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And that's the ending of the Gospel of Mark in the Codex Sinaiticus. In this, the King James Bible, there's an additional 12 verses where Jesus then appears to his disciples, providing proof of the resurrection and proof of his divinity. The question was, why did the long ending not appear in the Sinaiticus, the oldest known edition of the Bible? It appears that sometime after the fourth century, a longer ending of Mark including the resurrection appearances, had been inserted into the official Bible text. The arrival of Sinaiticus was an absolute bombshell in Victorian society and in the world, not just of theology, but across the whole community. For the first time, it could be demonstrated without any doubt to the scholarly mind that the end of Mark, as people had known it for hundreds of years, was not the end as Mark had written it. That meant that there was a real doubt about all of the Gospels. If what Tischendorf and some of these other people were saying was true, then this meant that God had allowed the Bible to become corrupted. What this meant for a Protestant who believed that their self depended on a reading, a reaction to the Word of God was, how is my self based on a falsehood? It was absolutely threatening. At the age of 59, 15 years after discovering Sinaiticus, Tischendorf died following a stroke. Until the end, he remained robust about the short ending of Mark in the Sinaiticus, delighted that this more reliable Bible text had been found. Questions raised by his discoveries about the original Bible text and its transmission over the centuries wouldn't go away.